Chapter 7. My first impression of Poshuf as hell on earth never changed. I only needed one look to see that this was an entirely foreign place. No matter how difficult life had been in the ghetto, at least outwardly, it had appeared a familiar world. Yes, we were packed like sardines into too few rooms, but those rooms were in normal apartment buildings. There were streets and sidewalks and the sounds of a city beyond the walls. Poishuf was an alien world. It was built on two Jewish cemeteries that the Nazis had desecrated and destroyed. It was barren, dismal, chaotic. Rocks, dirt, barbed wire, ferocious dogs, snarling guards, and acre upon acre of drab barracks stretched as far as the eye could see. Hundreds of prisoners in threadbare clothing hurried from one work detail to another, prodded to quicken their pace by gun-wielding German and Ukrainian guards. The moment I entered the gates of Poshuf, I was convinced I would never leave alive. Immediately, the guards divided our group by gender. I shuffled into my assigned barracks on the men's side of the camp. My hope of finding my family plummeted when I learned that I was to stay there indefinitely. I had no idea where my father and David might be. With only my precious thermos bottle, my legacy from Mr. Luftig, and my blanket, I crawled onto a narrow wood shelf and lay down. Famished, but with no prospect of food, in a cramped room filled with strangers, mercifully I quickly sank into the oblivion of sleep. I felt abandoned. All too soon, lights flashed on. Although it was still pitch black outside, guards beat with their sticks on the bunks and shouted at us, Stay auf! Stay auf! Get up! Get up! It was time to assemble for work assignments. Half asleep, I dragged myself off the shelf and joined my group along with row upon row of other prisoners from each of the other barracks. We stood in the dark and cold for hours. We were counted, counted again, threatened, counted again, abused, and finally assigned to work. The work was both menial and dangerous. Most days I hauled lumber, rocks, and dirt to build more barracks. At the end of the day, we received a meager portion of watery soup. Then I returned to my shelf in the barracks for a few hours of fitful sleep before beginning the ordeal all over again the next morning. The room where I slept was so crowded that if I left to use the latrine, my spot would be taken when I returned, and I would have to elbow my way back into a space. One night, as I stumbled back into my bunk, I found my blanket was gone. I had stupidly left it there, and another prisoner, perhaps even colder and more desperate than I, had taken it. I was left to wrap my arms around myself, think of my mother's embrace, and will myself to sleep. Then the miraculous happened. Some of the men who had begun to watch out for me told me where in the camp the Schindler Jews had been assigned. I resolved to search until I found my father and David. This was not an easy decision. I had to be alert every second. If I were spotted away from my work, I could be killed. But my yearning to see my father and brother overpowered reason. And so weak as I was, I stole away determined to open every barrack door until I found my father and brother. Finally, totally exhausted, when I thought I couldn't find the strength to open one more door, I did. There they were. I had never thought of my father and brother as beautiful, but in that moment, I thought they were the most beautiful people I had ever seen. They were overjoyed to see me, they hugged me, hardly daring to believe that I had made it out of the ghetto. We thought you had been deported, David said. As he spoke, I saw pain and helplessness in my father's eyes as he realized how weak and emaciated I had become. We talked in whispers for a few nervous minutes. As I left, my father promised that he would encourage Schindler to hire me. 
Meanwhile, he cautioned, I must stay where I had been assigned and avoid attracting any attention. A week or so later, I had learned enough about the layout of the camp to guess where my mother was. Poichouf was a bit chaotic at times as the construction continued and new prisoners arrived. I decided to take advantage of one of those times and risk sneaking into the women's area to find her. I was so small and thin, and my hair was so shaggy, I could pass for a girl, but I knew I would be severely punished if I were discovered. Yet the danger was worth it if I could find my mother. I admit that on that day, I was just plain lucky. Without too many wrong turns, I found her barracks. She was lying on her wooden shelf. When she saw me, she couldn't believe her eyes. But to my disappointment, she seemed more startled than happy. How did you get here, she asked. Before I could answer and tell her that I had found my father and brother, she told me, you can't stay. You have to go. Tears filled her eyes, even as she uttered the words that would send me away from her. At the very last moment, she reached into the pile of rags on the shelf where she slept and pulled out a walnut-sized piece of dry bread. It was all in the world my mother had to give me, the best she could do. I'm sure it was the only food she had. She embraced me for a few priceless seconds, pressed the bread into my hand, and pushed me out the door. It broke my heart to leave her and it broke hers to send me away. If I had known at that moment that I would not see her again all that year, I probably wouldn't have left her. And had I stayed, both of us and perhaps others in the barracks surely would have paid with our lives. It was terrible to be alone without my parents, not knowing where Salig and Herschel were, or even if they were still alive. Especially at night, I tried to remember their faces, I told myself that they were thinking of me even as I was thinking of them, that in our minds and hearts we were together. But that thought wasn't enough to comfort or sustain me. All I could do was hold on and hope that my father would somehow find a way for me to be with him. Meanwhile, I did as I was told. Some days I hauled lumber or stones, other times I pounded rocks into gravel, or dug up cemetery markers that the Nazis then used to pave the roads. It was exhausting, dangerous work, and a single misstep could mean death. One day while carrying a large rock, I slipped on a broken headstone and badly gashed my leg. I had to go to the camp infirmary to have the cut bandaged. I learned afterward that the commandant of Poichouf, SS Hauptsturmführer Amun Gert had entered the infirmary shortly after I had left and shot all the patients, just shot every single one of them point blank for no reason except that he felt like it. Had I remained just a few minutes longer, I would have been executed with the others. When I heard what had happened, I promised myself that no matter what, I would never go to the infirmary again. Yet avoiding the infirmary didn't mean escaping the net of cruelty that Amon Gert cast over the camp. When my work detail passed men in other groups, I would hear the whispers being exchanged as they kept tally of the casualty lists from Gert and his henchmen, as if they were soccer scores. What's the total today, someone might ask. Jews 12, Nazis 0. It was always a zero for the Nazi dead. As the winter of 1943 began, the wrath intensified. I had been ordered to shovel snow with a group of men. With no winter clothes, I was so frozen I could hardly hold the shovel. Suddenly, Hauptstenführer Gert showed up and on a whim demanded that the guards lash each one of us 25 times with their savage leather whips. None of us could figure out the provocation, but that did not matter. As commandant, Gert could do whatever he wanted, with or without a reason. He seemed to thrive on inflicting agony on the helpless. 
He watched the spectacle for a while, then decided that the whippings were going too slowly. So he had guards set up long tables and lined us up in rows, four across. With three men twice my age and stature, I went up to receive my punishment. The whips had little ball bearings at the end, intensifying the pain. I leaned over the table and awaited the first lash. When it came, it felt like someone was cutting me open with a knife. One, I cried out as the whip cracked. My instinctive reaction was to cover my backside before the next stroke could hit. And so the next crack of the whip fell across my hands. Two, I managed to get out. Three, four, Although I was numb from the cold, the pain seared through me each time, like being branded by a poker. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Would this torture never end? But I knew I had to hold on and not falter or it would start all over again. I knew I couldn't survive a second or a third round. After twenty-five blows, I staggered away delirious with pain. Somehow I managed to stumble back with the others to our work detail. My legs and buttocks throbbed. They were black and blue for months, and sitting was torture. Driven by pain and desolation, that evening I risked additional beatings or worse by sneaking over to my father's barracks. I simply had to see him and tell him what had happened. Before I could get the words out, I began to cry. Trying to hold it together, not yet 15 years old, I had finally cracked. I desperately needed his sympathy, but he offered none. He showed not a flicker of emotion when I arrived or when I finally blurted out my story. Instead, he remained silent. His face hardened and his jaw clenched. Perhaps what he felt was relief that no matter how bad it had been for me, I had survived Gert's brutality. Or maybe his anger and sadness were so great that he feared breaking down if he tried to console me. Whatever he felt, he didn't share it. Forlorn, feeling totally abandoned, I returned to my barracks. As I lay on my shelf, I listened as the men reviewed the day's score. Jews, 20. Nazis, zero. Despondently, I picked a few lice off my sweater, but gave up trying to get them all. I just didn't care anymore. The lice crawled through my hair and my clothes as I finally drifted off to sleep. The horrific days came to follow a routine. We were stunned awake before dawn by the sound of crashing doors and shouted orders. We assembled in groups according to our barracks number and were counted and recounted while short-tempered, cruel guards harassed us, or worse. Then we were assigned to groups for the day's labor. Sometimes we left camp to chop ice, shovel snow, or work on roads. We never got anything to eat until the workday ended. Then a big pot was brought out as we raced to retrieve our indispensable spoons and bowls. That one meal never varied. Hot water with a little salt or pepper, and if we were lucky, bits of potato skin and slivers of other vegetables. The men ladling the soup were prisoners too, and sometimes one of them would take pity on me, stir the bottom of the pot, and put a real piece of potato into my bowl. That made the day exceptional. After the meal, we huddled on our shelves, trying to gather strength for the next day. Through the barbed wire fences surrounding the camp, I could look out and sometimes see the children of the German officers marching back and forth, wearing their Hitler Youth uniforms and singing songs praising the Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler. They were so exuberant so full of life and enthusiasm. While just a few yards away from them, I was exhausted and depressed, struggling to survive another day. Only the thickness of the barbed wire separated my life in hell from their life of freedom. 
We might as well have been on separate planets. I couldn't begin to understand the injustice of it all. As the months dragged on, I despaired. I didn't dare risk trying to see my father or mother again, not because I feared for myself, but because I feared the punishment that would come to them if I were discovered in their barracks. My first reaction to Poishouf, that I would never leave alive, was reinforced every day. I came to believe that I would never make it out of the camp. Any day I thought my luck would run out and I'd be killed, either by Gert or one of his henchmen. I'd be a number in that day's score. Gert was a stout man with an arrogant swagger and a bully's sneer. His chilling stare haunted me and filled not only my waking hours, but my nightmares. Even when he was nowhere in sight, I felt his eyes upon me. During the day, from time to time, I would see my brother or father at a distance, heading from one job to another, and the brief sighting would give me a sliver of hope. But all too soon, that hope would drain away. Although Schindler had not hired me, I did have a bit of good fortune. The brush factory where I had worked in the ghetto had been relocated to Pashuv, and I was assigned to the 12-hour night shift. I was relieved to have a steady work assignment and an official place to go. Being idle or waiting for random work assignments only invited trouble. Working in the brush factory also meant I could be inside where it was warmer instead of outside chopping ice or shoveling snow. Yet the brush factory too had its horrors. One time while I was at work, a guard singled me out. I had been promoted from gluing on the bristles to fastening the wooden halves of a brush together with brads. It was meticulous and demanding work, but I had a knack for it. The guard watched me work and then pointed a gun at my head. If the next brad is crooked, I'll shoot you, he said. I didn't pause or look up. I just kept working and fastened the halves together with a brad. I moved the finished product toward him to inspect. It was straight. He walked away and I continued working as if nothing had happened. I had kept my fear under control, but inside I was trembling. A few nights later, Amon Gert stomped into the factory with his two dogs, Ralph and Rolf, and a squad of his flunkies. Bored and probably drunk, he pulled his pistol out of its holster and shot our foreman at point-blank range for absolutely no reason. As the foreman crumpled to the floor, blood pooling under his head, Gert turned his attention to us. Waving the gun, he yelled an order at his men, who divided us into two groups. Somehow I knew that this separation was not a good thing. Sure enough, I found myself on the wrong side once again, assigned to a group of children and older workers. In other words, assigned to the group deemed expendable. Gert and his men marched back and forth, debating something. I couldn't hear what. When their backs were turned, I held my breath and sneaked over to the other group, the one made up of stronger workers. If Gert had seen me, he surely would have shot me or ended my life in an even worse way. But in the end, it didn't matter which group I was in. After a few minutes, Gert lost interest in his game. He holstered his gun, and as abruptly as he had entered the factory, he left, his two dogs trailing him out the door. We stood in our groups for another half an hour, too terrified to move. Finally, one of the guards told us to go to our barracks. Once there, many of the men broke down, sobbing, realizing how close we had come to death. This time, I didn't cry. I had grown numb to what might happen to me, to whatever my fate might be. In late 1943, Schindler cajoled and bribed Gert and other SS leaders for permission to build a sub-camp on the property adjacent to Emalia. He argued that it would be far more efficient to have the workers a few steps from the factory instead of two and a half miles away. 
the hours wasted in forming lines and walking back and forth between Himalaya and Poishuf could be better spent producing goods and making a profit. The Schindler subcamp was built, and in the spring of 1944, my father and David moved there. I learned through the camp network of rumors that my sister Pesa had also been assigned to a similar subcamp on the property of the electrical factory where she worked. My mother and I were alone once again, as we had been in the ghetto, but this was much worse, partly because I was separated from her, partly because it was such a terrible, dangerous place. I sank into deeper despair. When word passed through the camp that Schindler planned to add 30 Jews to his workforce, I didn't think anything about it. However, a few days later, I learned that a list had been created and my name was on it, along with my mother's. I couldn't believe it. It seemed too good to be true. After a year of trying, had my father finally succeeded in getting us into Schindler's factory? I counted off the days until we were to leave. Finally able to see a way out of the Poishuf Inferno, I felt stronger in spirit, if not in body. Luckily, my spirit willed my body to keep going. Then, the day before our scheduled transfer, came a crushing blow. My supervisor at the brush factory told me my name had been crossed off the transfer list. I was to stay at my current job in Poishuf. No words can express the absolute terror I felt. Having been given a little ray of hope, the loss of it was worse than not having had it at all. I knew I wouldn't survive the next month in Poishuf, let alone the next year. I was starving. I lived in constant fear. I found myself cowering at the slightest sound or movement. What could I do? How could I go on? On the day that the new Schindler Jews were to leave for the subcamp, I sneaked away from my job at the brush factory to see my mother off. It was a miracle that nobody stopped me as I walked across the camp toward the gates where those who were leaving for the subcamp had assembled. As I moved closer, I told myself that I had to act. I couldn't let this last opportunity disappear. I had no future in Poishuf. I might as well die attempting to be with my mother. My last few steps put me in front of the German officer in charge of the transfer. My eyes were on a level with his enormous belt buckle adorned with a large Nazi swastika. I am sure this man was one of the ones who roamed the camp shooting people, either following Gert's orders or just for his own maniacal perversion. I gulped and made my case to him in German. I am on the list, I told him, but somebody crossed my name off. The man didn't respond. In an effort to strengthen my case, I said, My mother's on the list. What gave me the audacity to speak to him as if he were a person capable of seeing reason and responding, I'll never know. And as if that wasn't enough, I added, My father and brother are already there. I couldn't have put my life at greater risk. And then I waited. Agonizing second followed agonizing second, as the officer seemed to ponder what to do with me. I was lucky he thought it all and didn't just pull out a gun and shoot me, resolving in a second the dilemma presented to him by this little Jewish boy. Then he motioned for his assistant to bring over the list. I pointed to my crossed-out name. That's my name right there, I told him. The officer peered down at me, grunted, and pointed toward the group of workers leaving for Schindler's subcamp. What made him listen to me and respond as he did, I will never know. Did he take pity on me, a boy separated from his family? Did he see one of his own children in me? Or was he simply being a bureaucrat who didn't like the fact that a name had been crossed out without his official permission? There's no way of knowing. People like him could do whatever they wanted, show mercy, or its opposite. My legs quaking, I quickly made my way into the group and found my mother. 
She had been standing near the front, staring straight ahead as commanded, completely unaware of what was causing the delay at the back of the group. She could hardly contain her joy as I quietly appeared beside her and slid my hand into hers. We somehow managed to stand silently, scarcely breathing, not wanting to draw attention to ourselves. We waited for what seemed like an eternity until the gate opened. Then, finally, our group started to move, and I dared to think that my time in hell might at last be coming to an end.